culture is values in action culture is about how you behave when you know actually no one's watching do you think it's very important or is it overrated to be need and <laughs> pre pandemic uh, there was a greater sense of uh, belonging do you think we somewhere need to update our people principles or add new principles can i become the part of the larger culture behind the switched off camera and my answer is no if i'm building this place that i don't want to be in then i don't know what i'm building i think if i would change one thing about fractal i would want us to be even bolder than we are being with 23 years on the board and uh, uh, global footprint that spans 18 countries 4500 plus people at fractal the continued success and growth of fractal is no accident it's been uh, supported by our culture uh, which is deeply rooted in trust transparency and freedom to all of us but we cannot stop here we have to take fractal to more than 100 years and uh, that's the goal and the only uh, core differentiator and supporter which will take us uh, to 100 plus years is our culture today we have about 68% of fractalites who are with us for less than 2 years about 18% are with us for 2 to 4 years and about 14% of 4 plus years and in the past couple of years most of the fractalites have joined us sitting behind a screen virtually so it's even more important for us to keep the fractal culture alive and uh, flow it through the multi generational and diverse uh, population at a fractal and our culture is just not an handbook of uh, values or list of principles uh, that we have it's the lived experience and also as our group chief shrikant says it's the energy in the room so that's what uh, we are hoping for with that i welcome all of you to fractal unfiltered this is the uh, first of its kind uh, program that we are doing and we will explore our origin of our culture uh, with some of our founding members here to see how our culture is built and the uh, decode uh, you know how those whole values and our ecosystem uh, is being done so with this i also request all of you that all of us are participants here there's no audience so feel free to you know talk your truth uh, and ask away questions it may you know ruffle some feathers that's okay but be as unfiltered as possible so let's get started our first episode of fractal unfiltered the first question the first session is about our culture and the building blocks of our culture so i'll start the first question with uh, shrikant how do you how do you define fractal's culture shrikant? in my world uh, culture is values in action so you have something that you think are the values you put them on the wall but really how are these values lived what are we prioritizing it's easy to distinguish right versus wrong it's certainly a lot easier than to choose between something that's good and something that's even better that's really the choice when it comes to culture so for example if we say fractal is a client first organization does this mean that we will put client results ahead of fractal's own success in when rubber hits the road do we do that or not that would be an example of whether we are living our stated values in terms of our culture we had a lot of conversation about uh, freedom of uh, uh, choice right mobility principles and so the question was whether it, you know for there is a client pressure saying you know you uh, we need some continuity for people and there is a uh, pressure from people saying that you know we need diversity of experience we need to keep moving to learn better so you know if you distance yourself and ask what is the right thing to do there that kind of choice also determines that this is what we believe in and therefore this is the action we must take that also shows how our culture comes to life as an example right we talk of transparency you mentioned transparency trust transparency and freedom are we willing to disclose our financial numbers to everybody to our clients to to fractalites to a board when we say that the same deck goes to the board and goes to the clients and goes to our people in our town halls if we are able to live that yes it's example of our culture so when rubber hits the road when the crunch situations come in how do we behave and do we choose transparency over something else like confidentiality for example as we were starting to discuss our ipo plans 
we had a lot of pushback from the lawyers. The kind of information sharing we've had in the organization before cannot happen anymore because it has a lot of sensitivity involved in that. But that will come against our culture. So I dug up some examples of what how Netflix did it and said, here's how Netflix is doing it. They're also a public company. They're able to still share their information with their all people before uh, they share it with the rest of the world. So why can't we replicate that? So those are some examples of, you know, when we define culture, culture is about the choices we make every day in reality, as opposed to what is the state and intent in the values. Why is culture so important for you personally? My daughter goes to school, she's 13 year old. And on the first day of the school, the entire class comes together and they define what are the essential agreements that they will follow. Uh, and they are put up on the wall and that kind of forms the core uh, principles with which they are going to, you know, uh, study and play together. Uh, so I see culture as those essential agreements that, you know, the one thing which I remember, we used to do it and that's, I don't think it happens uh, as much is uh, whenever we used to have any big meeting, after that, for 15, 20 minutes, the entire, after the meeting is over with the client, we would get together and we would debrief. That I thought was a great example of learn and grow because the context there and all of us figuring out of what went right, what went wrong. And we would, you know, the next meeting, it would show up. So it's those practices, uh, how we are showing, how we are conducting our meeting, how we are doing a project. It's, you know, those, those, uh, that's what defines culture for me. So very important that way. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. From what I remember, that was, the debriefs were longer than the meetings. <laughs> <laughs> is it all, is it even today it's the same? I think it, it, it does happen and uh, I'm sure it happens, but that's one part of it which we could dial up. Uh, it's, 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 it's the in-context learning which was so important. One thing that, that's, that gets triggered but what uh, Natwar is saying is also what we kept hearing back from our clients in multiple meetings. They would say, we picked you as a provider because of your culture. And that's when Frenny got interested. In. <laughs> okay, this, this, okay, this can be. <laughs> that other thing is simply working. I chose Fractal because of culture. So to me, I mean, culture is everything. Is the reason why I'm here. I'm here because it's fun. I'm here because I'm surrounded by people who I have developed connections with. I'm here because I feel safe. I'm here because I feel I'm heard. And to me, actually, it's absolutely everything. Uh, it is that intangible, but the mighty and powerful that actually sticks, right? And uh, it's 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 really a feeling, you know. It's when people ask me, you know, what's fractal like to work at. I don't, you know, talk about, oh, I'm doing this program, you know, or I'm building this policy. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about how I feel. You know, I'm talking about, you know, I go to office, this is what it feels like, I, you know, these are the kind of people I work with, you know, or, or some incident that took place, right, which really um, defines the culture. With, and, you know, culture is about how you behave when, you know, actually no one's watching, right? So for me, I think culture is the mighty and powerful. Uh, it's hard to define, hard to catch, right? And really, you know, define in certain ways, but it really sticks. I think like Natwar said, uh, the culture is also, uh, the base of our culture is also our values and our principles. Question to Ajay, uh, uh, you know, how did we decide? We have four values, client first, learn and grow, think big, act fast, extend extreme trust and be accountable, right? These are the four values which we have. We had a different set of values earlier, which like some of them were mother and apple by statement, which are there in almost all companies. And they didn't really differentiate us any of our competitors, anyone. So I guess it happened about six, seven years ago where some of us met and really brainstormed and came out with these four things uh, which we have right now. I mean, just to explain what um, Ajoy is saying, we had seven values before that. We chose them with a lot of care and a lot of deliberation. But what we realized by 2016 or even before that was that these values were all defined as abstract nouns like excellence, integrity, respect, professionalism, these kinds of 
and what we realize is that abstract nouns are abstract and hard to follow and you don't think of examples very quickly and they also some of them like integrity you know of course we have high integrity but is that a differentiator so we said okay some of them are permission to play values you don't have to call them our values is any way they are permission to play so let's get rid of those values and then let's create simple actionable verbs in that anybody can understand and then we had four of those values of those three we thought were something that we were already living to some extent or or otherwise and one we thought was aspirational so client first we thought this is exactly how fractal is working for the last many many years so there's no challenge about that learn and grow we agreed very quickly that that's as fundamental to fractal we also agreed that extend extreme trust and be accountable is part of our people principles it comes from our people principles you know uh, trust transparency and freedom so it, that sounds okay the one we thought we are not living but want to live is think big and act fast that's the one value we didn't think we were living but it was an aspirational value so we called it out as much now having said that having arrived with these four values with i think it took us about a day or so this time it was a little more efficient but then we actually kept it and sort of baked it fully for the next 6 to 7 months with other people in inside fracking before we actually launched it in frack so it actually maybe even longer so that's so the values that as as they currently exist articulated the way they currently articulated happened only in 2017 first now i'm not able to recall the timelines but some of the strategic choices we made are also reflection of these uh, values so we had our mwc strategy for example we used to earlier waste a lot of time in going after clients you also explain what is mwc mwc must win clients so we used to go after very small clients where we couldn't add value they couldn't get value from us i think think big act fast at least the acting fast part of it saying no to such leads uh, came into life after that she can't and rash basically i just wanted to know why is people principles like very important uh, for as a fractal why do you think this is very important or is it overrated do we need it by <laughs> <laughs> in my memory when i joined fractal it was 70 people when i the first day that i joined somebody was playing guitar and eating dal at the table i just thought it was a cool vibe everybody was great uh, so i wanted to be with people who were like that so i i joined and it was uh, you know the first year was bad but after that everything was great <laughs> and, uh but uh, you know uh, that started to shift there is always this conversation about scale right how long can we sustain this as you scale you must bring in some processes some discipline all of that is true uh, it's a question of degree and how you do it so th- th- this conversation reached a pitch in uh, 2013 or 2012 maybe so there were at that time all kinds of uh, things that were put into place one of the time sheets was a favorite example here on app your favorite right time in time out then then come on so was it and then sometimes there was a report published of the number of hours spent in the office and things like that so and, but that was of course just one example of what was happening but in the environment there was this tightness and so there is this inflexibility and at the, at one point i was feeling like you know it is suffocating me i cannot be in this and i was thinking that if i'm building this place that i don't want to be in then i don't know what i'm building so it that was sort of the emotion that i was going through it then by december of that year 2012 then the i think of it like you do know, in college i don't know how many of you went through these uh, morshas right <laughs> like this <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you you uh, shout some slogans and you're on the roads it, it was the environment was becoming like that like you know there, there was something uh, pressure cooker scenario and then uh, this uh, people principles uh, you know i think she can came up i don't know why i remember some whatsapp type of message once even <laughs> yeah so from the whatsapp back so there was this email back and forth or messaging back and forth about about this I just was on vacation somewhere I think and then yeah need to get advantage of oh, okay. <laughs> and finally you know there was many hours of discussion many many hours of discussion and then I I just was I, the thing I remember I, everybody was generally uh, on board I mean it's I'm simplistically saying of course not everybody was on board there was a lot of for a year or two or maybe even now right we go through many of those uh, questions but 
एटी परसेंट बट आई वुड आई रिमेंबर इज जॉय एंड श्रीकांत कॉन्वर्जेशन आई जॉय वॉज नॉट अग्रींग टू समथिंग एंड देन फाइन श्रीकांत यूज ऑल हिज परसुएसिव पावर्स कर लें सर जॉय फाइनली ही सर जॉय कर लेते हैं यार Rajesh said his favorite principle 2.0. I would say it was around 2009-10. Edward was telling us that that point of time, as you have to go to on-site with the without notice in the sense, just giving us two months notice or so, and telling us going you have to go to on-site. So Sagar, myself, Abdul, and Vikram, we formed a group and we went to Shikhar <laughs> and we said that we have we need a employee bill of rights. <laughs> <laughs> remember that that was the first. people principles and on the, i just want to add one point on the on the culture side i would say that one thing on culture which i definitely will say and i, I joined fractal in the was my first joining in fractal was in 2007 and fractal was a 70 80 member company then i think and uh, obviously it was very transparent small company and she can't i remember uh, when we were, i was working in my first saturday in office and chikant comes to my uh, desk and he invites me for a house warming party in his uh, house in uh, bandra uh, so i was like so happy that ceo invites me in his house warming party so you see that so that was the transparency and today you see today also the ceo is talking to the people every week so that is the transparency that the company is able to maintain the culture the culture that the company is able to maintain so i think that is what we need to understand that that's 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 the culture that we have been able to hold as a company so and we need to pat our back to some extent somehow somehow i think we become over critical about us a lot and we don't for we forget to pat our backs at some and many many instances but i think there are times that we need to pat our back at some point that's right yes sir awesome just to add to what anand has said i think our people principles is somehow basically they also bring out our culture and i because i remember my first six months i act, practically lived all those values four values that i was working with raj we had to put some difficult network was there we were working on some difficult plans so client came first trust i was a newbie and was given something i learned fairly deliberate there was one instance when there was an escalation and i remember there was some party some uh, team party that was happening and i remember gorov raj uh, i was sitting and coding and these guys were sitting just behind and at one point they said that it's okay just do this you go you enjoy the party and i said that i have not done a check on this he's got to forget it we need to check it and send it so that's the kind of trust that they had in me right that's what actually made me feel like you know it, this is how i need to treat my so that too was it was not defined as people principle back then But those were the principles that I put in my head that you know this is how I need to start in, you know treating my team. So I think people principles go very strongly with the kind of culture that you have come. You heard something and you saw how you were treated, and then that's how you tend to realize that this is how I should treat my my team. I believe that if you find abusive managers, right? I'm sure these abusive managers were abused when they were on a manager, and they are just continuing the cycle. So in some ways. by actually creating this culture we are not only obviously creating and maintaining the fractal culture we are creating a bunch of managers who will wherever they go eventually will continue that tradition in their in their organization i think it's very important to codify it's very important to create common language and common understanding because one is you know shared history you know that some people who've been here built it together over the years and then the ability for things like that to percolate visualize as we are 10000 people right it's very important that up front people understand and have that common language and common understanding uh, i think this codification is very important you know in fact for again i shouldn't be saying this but i will for the first one or year i hadn't read the people principles i didn't even know what they were you know and then you know i started hearing about it in conversations and you know few conversations with a few people who believe in people principles um and when i actually read the people principles and what they mean examples of what you should do and more importantly examples of how you should not behave right that's when the penny drops for you you know so i i wish we would do more around people principles in fact i don't think a lot of fractalites even know our people principles and what they really mean i think we need to do more there but in terms of is it required i think absolutely yes yeah can can i build on that and i think 
our people principles are underrated <laughs> not <laughs> often <Yes. over. laughs> and underappreciated and we all take it for granted because we in some way or the other live those people principles so that is why we assume that oh these are obvious but some, the obvious also needs to be stated the obvious has to be documented because we are not here forever if you have to build it for the long term we have to create you know, johnson and johnson still has that credo like 100 years later after creating and it guides their future so every organization needs to have this documentation and it is important to write it down because we will not be around at some point of time it will be interpreted reinterpreted so to the extent possible we should put the put our vision our um, sort of uh, thinking around the constitution of this company in such a way that it can stand the test of time so i think it is under marketed underrated uh, though i think lived there are multiple times and you have seen some of those men's more than me actually and i have also seen some of those men's that in difficult times when push come to shove we have a habit of blaming people principles how do you react to those situations and how do you think that we as a fact lights should react to those situations so uh, you know maybe i can just give a little history lesson on on uh, people principles and then answer your question so I think the people principles how we formulated them let me raj has told some of the story so we were 2013 we were going through uh, we had just raised our private equity round first private equity round ta had invested in fractal and as it happens with every investment there's this heightened need to show that we it is working that this investment was not wrong so there's a lot of pressure to perform in the very beginning phases of every private equity investment no matter how many times you raise the money it this this kind of pressure is there and that triggered the people principles i felt that this organization is we cannot guarantee the long term success of this organization unless we codify how we actually will run this company and how we treat our people so that was really the reason why i sent out that email there were eight points in that email and it eventually became seven principles it created one conference room which was called ks statistics back then people would just come into that room and we would spend the whole day discussing it every point probably discussed every single point in that people principles for two three days at a time wow it just in excruciating in some ways but also very clarifying because that's when we could document something and have the confidence that it will work now coming to that we realized even while creating people principles that when you extend extreme trust right in in the people principles some people will take advantage of that so it turns out it's 95% of the people follow it's 5% people who do not do not follow so we said look 95% 5% we cannot penalize the 5% of the 95% for the sake of 5% now what we did not realize at that point of time which we learned later on is that if 5% people are misusing people principles the 95% people feel really bad about that they feel like look i am doing all the right things and look at these 5% people they getting away with murder so it doesn't work and plus the 5% who do not obey the people principles or do not follow people principles or do not understand the spirit of people principles and abuse it can do a lot of damage for example we said unconditional expense reimbursements no dress code you can choose your manager these are the kinds of things that are there in, in the people principles right so people can really misuse or abuse these kinds of principles so two things we had to do we had to fix we had to address the 5% while continuing to maintain the people principles so when people come back and say that you know this is because of people principles you can say look here are all the benefits of people principles there are all the good things that are happening because of people principles yes we do have some issues because of which you know people will misuse it but that is a feature that's not a bug we expected it to happen and we have some mechanisms to arrest or fix those those 5% cases that come i think my question uh, is to raj so raj uh, any experiences that you can share where you feel that you know you have seen lot of fractal culture coming into play or you yourself have lived up to in some very difficult ambiguous situation so without getting into details too much detail uh, there was a person who was going through a tough phase in their life and uh, they did something that was not quite right uh, if you go by the book it was definitely wrong uh, this it was quite black and white that what they had done was not 
was not right. Going by the book again, that person should have been fired. But, you know, in the context of everything that was happening, that person was going through a tough time in their life. They were like in the most delicate state of their life. So what should one have done at that point? Should one have said that this is not okay? I understand everything, but this is this is not okay. You should go. Uh, or should one have said that let's give this another chance? It's not okay. Let's give this another chance. And I'm really glad that we took the path where we said let's give it, give this another chance. That's what happened, and that person has flourished after that. Uh, they have they have done really well in their career in their life. Uh, overall, there I mean I see I am not in touch, but I see how they're you know on social media how they're updating their life status. It's it, it's like really good. It's easy to uh, take a very hard stance. There's some bravado in in doing that, and we should do that in in places where it merits. But there is a nuance to bring into situations like this. So I think I, I I feel like these are the moments that reinforce what what really we stand for, what really true culture is. One follow up question on this. So you did mention that you know uh, it was a difficult kind of situation, and in such situations where you have to take some very important decision, obviously one individual role cannot take this decision. So obviously you are with a group where you have to take such calls. and in a group there will be divided opinions in such instances so is it the culture that somehow helps you to convince the group to you know probably take a certain decision i think it is uh, how much conviction you have in in that decision and of course the people around you like i have uh, like you know we each have our own form of decision making definitely guided by culture and values definitely this is the whole idea of values if you cannot bring a value to a conversation to a decision then what's the point in having those values so we can, people principles and values have to be brought into every conversation and say that look this is a we are talking of a specific but unless we take an the the ideal that we want to live up to and then bring it down to the specifics then the ideal will just stay on the wall so yes they have to be their guidelines they will not give you the exact decision but those are the guide posts that you have to use to make the right decision so there is managerial discretion and there is obviously judgment involved in any decision making but these principles are like the pillars that surround that structure that give you a, a way to think about the problem and therefore we have to bring those principles into more and more at least i try to do it whenever there's such a conversation comes in i bring in a principle this is why i am suggesting what i'm suggesting thank you thank you for that question is there anyone else who want to share any any uh, lived experience that you have uh, any difficult uh, do you do you want to share or yeah biju biju obviously my experience with uh, fractals culture is from a very different perspective uh, because that's when uh, final mile and fractal decided to come together you know two companies decided to come together there are could be various factors and there are various factors involved uh, but i still remember um, i think i had one conversation in in our office where everyone was around i think ajoy obviously shrikant uh, natoa you were there uh, i think if i'm right after that uh, shrikant said biju i just want to talk to you about for 5 minutes i think we uh, just just beside the hall there was that particular room and both of us just spoke for about i, I still don't know what we spoke um uh, but i know after 10 minutes of that uh, then i came out and i was convinced on one thing there is something that is connecting us and that connecting us was you know there are certain things i believe as an individual as an organization as a leader of that organization but i knew when i was speaking to shrikant that uh, shrikant was living that and i can tell you that 5 to 10 minutes conversation is what it decided okay let's go ahead so not just between an individual who wants to join a company and be part of fractal even organizations who want to now be part of fractal uh, even at that level um, i think the cultures that we have or uh, the mutual connection that these cultures create um, to me makes a huge huge impact nilima and i were in a very big uh, prospect meeting we were trying to pitch that company and one of the person who was helping us get there was employee of that company who had applied to fractal some years ago 
but we did not select that person but despite that the experience the person had and the the image which fractal had for that person he still wants to work with fractal maybe not as an employee but with as a client and this is exactly what uh, rohini and i discuss all the time which is that we have a 1 in 200 selection ratio oh. 1 in 200 people get through to fractal the remaining 199 people we want them to be our brand ambassadors right that is how we treat them on that journey um, is super super important their experience of fractal is is very important because even if they don't join fractal they we want them to be fractal's biggest ambassadors over the years more so when this anniversaries come uh, people sometimes ask how come you are here for such a long time and if my partner is with me uh, before i say anything he will say that she will have nothing you know she has no complaints for so, fractal and uh, to stay longer it's not really about perks benefits or roles that you get it's much more beyond that how comfortable you feel in the environment what is the sense of belongingness you get and i think over the years there is a sense of belongingness with fractal people always ask me are why you still in fractal right i use one trump card and that trump card is culture <laughs> and after that they don't ask me anything on why are in fractal we end up discussing cultures right of all the journeys all the discussions that we have had and that works wonderfully well for me always i think that is one commendable uh, part on on the executive team that we do that we listen to the employees and we continue to do that so it's not that we did it at that time but at any point of time if on any principle we feel that we are lagging behind like for example mobility like we think that we are not implementing it very well then we go back we think about what we can do and we we you know try to uh, improve how how we uh, respond to that principle so i think that is something we should continue to do what i realized started happening was every time i asked for something or i said i want to do this nobody questioned why i was asked what do you need i think that was the experience of culture that really sort of kind of came alive and even today of course we all have rough days i do too and i you know people are like why are you so with fractal i'm like nay nay i'm not done i'm here there's still something about fractal i'm i need to be here i said this does not exist somewhere else and i don't know what that something is i can't put a finger on it sure i think it's the people taking a stand when the chips are down and uh that's the hardest that's when culture gets put to the test you know uh and you have to take that extreme stance Uh, so the stance that we took during covid and i remember that vividly because at that time i was in hiring and uh, we had all these offers which were out to campus grads we were getting a lot of calls and we were all just under the assumption that we will do what others are doing which is we'll play it by the ear right and that's what everyone pretty much was doing saying we don't know we can't comment we don't know where this is going to go and we'll figure as we move along and you know obviously there was a lot of anxiety there was a lot of fear and it was all coming our way and we could sense it and then we took a call fractal took a call and it was a public call right we announced it on the town hall we went out there and publicly declared this to all campus grads saying we're not going to rescind any offers and we are going to honor every single offer we don't know where we are going to be right we don't know where we're going either but we're going to honor and we're going to keep our word and when the chips are down and when you're under immense stress is when your culture uh, gets put to the test and how you respond in a situation like that i think is truly telling of who you really are so uh, it's the small stuff and then it's also you know the big sure. things so we are almost uh, up on the session but one final question i wanted to ask uh, one of us not to her and work can chime in maybe one other person so one of the point uh, which we considered and many others said is it's also how the managers or the leaders treat you that you treat others and that's how culture also shares right i know you are one of those leaders who have brought a lot of new leaders to fractal also right from the past to now a new ig team and all how do you uh, you know share the culture to these new leaders and how are they uh, taking to the culture because they are also coming from large organization they will have different view yeah this is the the classic problem of how does you know when we scale uh, how, does culture scale and that's when the culture gets tested i think as an exec uh, onboarding senior leaders is perhaps one of the most important job uh, so personally the way i did it is i mean we have to talk we have to talk to them once a week won't cut it it is about talking every day you are you are hiring them because they are great at what they are doing i think what they miss is the context of the organization 
so this is it's it, it's not about giving them a cultural culture 101 but it's about helping them settle in and navigate uh, and then all of the leaders are smart enough to understand you know how how should i behave uh, at frackley so one of those things that i do which uh, it's a little thing but i think it's quite powerful is language um and uh, like you know things like resources you know it's so commonplace to say you know i don't have the resources how many resources can i get and uh, this raj did with me right <laughs> when i do i don't know when i had a certain language which was you know i mean it's just the language that i've learned working so many years and uh, i was checked at every instance right saying it's people and um you know it's client and you know this is it's not you you know it's we and uh, language is very powerful because Absolutely. as you repeat one is you understand the essence of an organization you understand the intent you understand the ethos and how you think about things behind the word right and words and language are very powerful so the first thing it's a little thing but uh, the first thing that i do when new people join senior mid at any level is actively check for language uh, and you start seeing behaviors modify naturally bases the language that people are using so i found that point well i want to add one more thing to what natwar and rohini have said which is about how to onboard senior leaders we bring in senior leaders especially come with lots of experience usually and usually with different sizes and shapes of organizations many of our senior leaders come from very large organizations and therefore the instant thinking is that oh i am i've come from a much larger organization than fractal therefore i should be able to fix fractal that's the first instinct is that let's fix fractal because it works in this large organization yes we have to learn from them but we have to do it in our own way so what i tell senior leaders is to first work at fractal before you work on fractal right work at fractal don't work on fractal as of right now we want your bright ideas obviously that's why you are here in the first place we want your smarts we want your experience we want your intel intellect everything else what we want you to do is to first understand the system that's 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 something i say it's not the most popular statement i make people don't <laughs> like it the senior leaders yeah. but i think we should do it actively and even do it at the interview stage itself so that they know that they're coming in it's not that we are asking them for their answers from accenture i mean frankly accenture answers are we could ask somebody in accenture and just copy paste it it's not going to work for us we have to find fractal answers i just want to take a step back and uh, understand that uh, how do we test the cultural fitment at that level and that's really something i want to think about how is it done because what happens is in the senior leadership level one in a 60 minute or a 120 minute interview i don't think we can assess the cultural fit second in such a senior level role if there is a major cultural misfit i think gradually over time it can ruin lot for the organization so how do we go about doing is i want to understand interviewing is the hardest part of my job i mean from if i it's someone says it is it is really hard especially when we are hiring senior leaders for all the reasons that you mentioned and i think um, while it's hard for the organization it's also hard for the individual uh who so is interviewing it's actually a bigger risk for the individual so the way to do that and the way we do that is essentially expose a large part of fractal to them so i know we are we are hiring one senior leader and uh, i don't know how many no, no, i think we've touched it okay that you know cross 20 met 80 pretty conversation con last right so that's the so <laughs> not <laughs> and it is it is uh, which 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 basically means not just the hiring manager but uh, the person which means his or her team the potential team they talk to them left right bottom up everybody and 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 that's the idea the idea is to pick up any signal it's 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 not about evaluating person as much but to be able to give that person and ensure the rest of the person pick up uh elements uh, but that's one way and then typically there is a debrief where those 19 people or seven or eight people kind of come together and go one by one and share what do what do we think of the individual and now it's time for a surprise uh, session that we have today which is called fractal furnace 
So I welcome all of you to Fatal Furnace. It's we are going to just turn up some heat uh, to some of the people in this room. You call it Fractal <laughs> Furnace. Yeah, yes. Fractal Furnace. <laughs> <laughs> That's the name. <laughs> See, this is it. There's no fire, but we'll heat it up. So this is how it is. There are some questions uh, uh, which uh, I, I know we have got from some of the fractalites. Uh, they wanted to ask this question. Still, the, uh, the point is to get as direct and unfiltered answer in this group. That's the point. So I will pick up uh, each card. Then I'll assign someone uh, in the group to get off of a rapid fire manner to answer the question. And it's one of the people principles that we have is you ask any question and get the 100% direct honest answer. So we are trying to go into test that uh, to see how we are all going to uh, you know perform. So with that, let's jump into Fractal Furnace. <laughs> After this, we'll get to change the name. Uh, yeah, oh, maybe. <laughs> so the first question I'm going to ask Rohini here. Uh, why do we publish our salary bans? Even when it creates a lot of confusion and unhappiness as people compare their salary relative to their respective grades compensation is relative right and we know that so the comparison is bound to happen comparison happens not just on compensation it happens in life in general right you always look at people ahead of you rarely look at people behind you and uh, i feel that the more you shroud it in secret right uh, the worse it gets uh, in fact, compensation, and I, keep, and I say this very often, is that it's the worst kept secret in any organization. Everyone anyway knows each other's compensation. It's pretty much within the first one week, you'll figure out where you are. Uh, it, through corridor conversations, conversations with, you know, new friends that you've made, you will find out where you are on, you know, a band. You will piece that information together. And I also say that this is irrespective of levels and grades. I've seen very senior people you know, spend time trying to figure out where they're placed in the pecking order. It's basic human nature. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but it's just the way we operate. We want to know where we stand. And the reason why we publish uh, compensation ranges is because we want to bring that to the foref forefront, right? Nothing to hide. And if you are at a certain point and on the compensation band, that is where you are. And there are certain factors that determine why you're there. Uh, and then you need to have a conversation around that. Everyone can't be at the top. Right, because then there won't be a bad. And so we feel that there's no need to hide any of this. In fact, you know, Shrikant and I very, you know, quite often uh, you know, have been having conversations around what if, right, we were to just crack this open entirely, right, and make it entirely transparent. Of course, you know, it'll come with the good and a lot of ugly as well. Uh, what is required to, you know, frame it like that or maybe move to a place like that. I'd love to see us move more towards transparency rather than, you know, completely try and keep locking things up in little black boxes because it's just going to create more anger, more anxiety and more pain along the line. Whenever you're publishing a new job, there is a new law that has come where you have to publish the the experience that's required, the salary ban that is there for that job and anyone who is applying should know that beforehand. So I think in Fractal, I think we are practicing it much before even a law came into picture. Ahead of time. Ahead of time. So I think that's something which is very, very beautiful and unique. And we kind of don't appreciate it, but it's there. So I think it's something that we live by, the transparency, not enacted by law, but just the DNA itself. I think you're the newest member. What do you think about our salary bans? It took me a while to figure it out, <laughs> but now it's helpful. And as a designer, I feel like I see everyone struggling around me. So it just makes you feel fortunate and to be in this like transparent environment. I think uh, this is publishing the salary bans. I personally feel is the greatest manifestation of our culture. And it acts as an sort of some autonomous filter wherein you know, people who don't subscribe to that kind of view will just, you know, move out eventually. I think it's a it's a great, great uh, uh, testament and we should uh, celebrate that. We should also nurture it. And Let's just add one point to what everything has already been said. The one point I want to add is about fairness. It automatically, the reason for this transparency was also to not have any warped incentive in the organization, in the system to to take advantage of situations. So by actually min, min, guaranteeing that everybody will be at the minimum of the salary band, we have actually taken care of that while still maintaining 
the 15% band we have in terms of uh, higher salaries, right? So that's that's one more thing that I think transparency is the one part that's been talked about. The fairness aspect of it is also there, which is to make sure that everyone is at the minimum of the salary band. So this may be a last uh, shakeup. What would you change after Fractal, about Fractal after seeing its 23-year journey? I think if I would change one thing about Fractal, I would want us to be even bolder than we have been. Take even bigger, make even bigger bets. Because I think what we'll regret more are bets not taken rather than bets taken. No bet that is existential risk to Fractal. But we have to consistently improve the or increase the size of the bets we take. I'll ask, enjoy this question. I'm working from home. Now the client wants me to come to office three days a week. And I do not live in the base location. Can I deny the client request as Fractal does not mandate us to work from office? See, we are here to serve clients. Absolutely. That That is our purpose. Big purpose of creating value for our clients. And if a job requires us to be somewhere, then we have to be there. There is... Uh, no no reason why someone should not be at a specific location or a specific place to do the job unless of course there are some very very different situations or meds, medical issues those kind of things but broadly yes if if a client needs us to be there we have to be there Raj do you think there's a difference in our culture pre-pandemic and now? Definitely uh, think that uh, pre-pandemic uh, there was a greater sense of uh, belonging uh, too fractal for uh, the emotional attachment was higher. During pandemic, uh, during the months of pandemic, we saw that decline. Even people, like, you know, most people had never been, set foot in a fractal office. So we kind of saw that uh, emotional attachment decline. Uh, so overall, in terms of culture at fractal, I think the, 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 uh, the, the, of course, the soul and the elements remain the same, but there is, there is a little bit of distance. And I think we need to do some work to bridge that. A lot of it is about being around, like we we have fun with, with people that we work with. So it's about being around the people that we work with and have the opportunity to bump into each other, to learn from each other. And that opportunity isn't there when you spend so long uh, without being at an office. So I, I think that that's, uh, as employees, we need to understand that and take a step forward. And as a system, Fractal needs to create opportunities to bring everyone uh, everyone together and I do think two things have happened you know post pandemic we went suddenly from a thousand people we went to four thousand people right and uh, almost 70 percent of fractal was new uh, so that definitely changed the culture changed the way we connected one with one another and then our expectations and our relationship with work also you know went through a major reset and I do think that people who are now coming back into offices are finding those connections again. I can see some of that getting reignited. Uh, and there is a difference. Uh, like when I come into office, I find, a, I get a lot more energy. I do the same work, but I, there's just so much more energy. There's more connection. And most importantly, there are shared moments. There's laughter. You know, to me, I think that's the biggest thing. There's a lot of joy and laughter. Like, you know, we share jokes. Uh, you know, we, we, you know, and that is where I think, uh, you know, magic really happens because that's where connections get formed. I do think it's very important for us to start bringing people back in or and building a muscle to be able to create that same joy and connection in a hybrid yeah. world. I, I, We don't have the answer to it, but I do hope that, I mean, it's something that we should definitely work. We will be working towards with so many people coming in and they're virtually meeting, that camaraderie is missing, right? How do you inculcate this culture? How do you inculcate this trust? Exchange? I think um, I think somewhere at the beginning, Srikant said, culture is nothing but values in action or values in behavior. But I think that values translating into action, into behavior, and behavior, I think we know, the best happens when it's a face-to-face. -face. Now, the post-pandemic, what has happened is, Work from home has actually created a distance between, uh, you know, each other. There's no doubt about it. Uh, virtual meetings came in. Um, the biggest issue that has happened, I still believe, the virtual meeting designs have not really understood that interaction is a what it should be. It's been developed by engineers for engineers. But even after that, what has really, <laughs> what has really happened is um, that um, that the the cameras that are there are switched off. Now, that 
it's actually even if there's a virtual meeting we when we look at each other's face and we can see like what's happening right now we're all nodding someone is not nodding someone they i just looked at shrikan to see what is reaction when i spoke over the engineer so you i i you know those are all hints that we get and we move on with our conversations and our connections the point that you know paroni was mentioning is all depends upon those little nuances around and there has been a big difference the post pandemic i think uh, the connections the opportunities for connections have dramatically changed and and the specific to the question that you asked has someone solved this yes i think there are two organizations who have solved this fairly well long back one is religion and our religion again are disparate people who are surrounded living in their own homes but they created rituals like on a sunday make sure all of you guys come here or on a friday please come to this place of worship and in that place they create a ritual to again if you look at it is nothing but create connections between that local community the other organization is the political parties or they created a very evocative big uh, you know sort of ideas or dreams that sort of connect us so even there is no physically there are many time we're not present but those evocative goals really bring us together but we have to learn because things have changed now you can't say we'll go back to the past and i think as roni again said it's it's hybrid work but i don't think any of us have really figured out how to achieve it but we have to achieve keeping our values intact how do we go about creating connections so that we actually build a, a strong culture maybe the adding on to biju's point actually so uh, as biju said that uh, you know we usually try to for better communication we try and you know ask the team to come on video but most of the answers that i get when i ask my team to come on video is that they are not in a state to come on video because they are working from home i don't know what state it's no it's you know you obviously you're way too comfortable when you're home i i admit no doubt about it but see i see i've been working with ritesh for 5 years now i think ritesh has seen me in possibly the worst of the situations i mean half a pony up <laughs> half asleep but still trying to get work done because we're sitting late in the evening but i just feel that we need to get that kind of comfort within the team as well right so that they they are comfortable coming on video in whatever state they are in because every time even even me i mean if i have to come on video i i'll try and you know be properly dressed you know dressed up you know have my hair combed and everything but that's something that that needs to break i feel because we we as i said yeah right because when i used to come to office pre pandemic i used to come i mean people who have seen me i used to come like absolutely in t-shirts and sport shoes yeah. guys somebody would think i'm going for a match now that is so <laughs> wow. it's too willing like <laughs> yeah i did i did actually so yeah that's that's i feel that that is something that we need to break i think one point i want to add the same time i think we have to also respect that sometimes uh, people are genuinely not able to uh, in especially like in mumbai right? people have small homes uh, one room houses lots happening around of course you can ask it you know in that environment how are you able to focus right but maybe people have figured their ways of working and sometimes it's more convenient for them to work out of home on that day or for a period of time because of some some situations uh, so in those situations it's hard for people to come on a uh, video yeah on the on the video point i think there there are genuine reasons why people can't be on video at some points of time i think it's over or misused my sense is that if when you're off video you can also be disengaged you don't have to pay attention there is no need to that did not exist that situation did not exist if you and i were having a conversation i would know whether you're engaged or not i will push back on that raj i think people should be on video as much as possible there could be exceptions but i think in one on one meetings it's possible you don't have to be in video it's okay because two people are talking to each other like phone we we've done phone calls before so we know how to we know the other person is listening or not listening but in a group setting if one person is talking and three people are off video and one person on video we don't know that other three people are engaged in the conversation or not they're not asking questions i think it will be important for us to at least have a policy that people be on video in group meetings there's no doubt about it we can if we, if we define each of our responsibilities doing the work done then we can work from home and we can do it but the big question is can we build culture can i become the part of the larger organization culture behind a switched off camera when i'm away from people 
And my answer is no. I think that's what I wrote in my last uh, week, my article also saying that if we define work from home as getting a job done, there's no doubt we can get job done. But can we build a strong culture, strong connections with people when we are temporarily and otherwise away, as Srikanth also said, behind a camera? All studies shows that, you know, in a, every time in a context, we all had an identity. Earlier, we had a home identity. So with that, we had our dress, our approach, all that was there in the home. But then the work identity was very different. And we had rituals to change from a home clothes to home. This one's we commuted and reached a new place. And our personality and our whole approach there was different. For the first time in, in human behavior, we are now forced to have two identities in the same place. And are we all really able to do a, a work identity in the home place? There's no this one to show that it is possible. And that is why we are not dressing up. But dress, forget about the dress below the on the camera. That's the dress that I wear below the camera angle, does it matter? Study shows, embodied clothing, yes, it matters. So I think employees, as, as we have to believe that each of them matters. So it's not about, I will do whatever I want to do the way I was at home, in my dress, in my combing, in what I do, and I can do my work as an employee without any change. I don't think home, uh, any uh, signs of human behavior is agreeing with that belief. So there's certain changes and you know those uh, things have to really come about sure um, so i'll i'll just use a quick anal analogy before i ask this question so see uh, as the context changes right you need you kind of update your model so you add new variables that uh, this is the data scientist <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> put into a changed context right so uh, do you think we somewhere need to update our people principles or add new principles given the new context. So, for example, we had a people principle which said you can ask a question and expect an honest answer. It's not a rule, but it's it's a principle that's driving a behavior, right? So, do you think uh, we need to sort of change or introduce some new principles for this today's context? I think uh, the principles themselves are timeless in my opinion so it's not that you know extend extreme trust should be now changed to extend trust only or don't extend extreme trust or anything like that so the principles are are timeless what we must do from time to time is uh, create some shared understanding of how do we live those principles what are the pushes and pulls Somebody said about culture, right? Like every time a new person comes on board, I mean, everybody said about culture, what I meant is the new hiring thing. So there is a push and pull that is created. New people are coming, new ideas. We must learn from that uh, equally to sort of merge our paths and, and evolve into something new. So in that process, clarifying the people principles, uh, uh, articulating the trade-offs, these are all important things for us to do. So that is the evolution that, that I think we must make. In my view, people principles are principles are timeless. So that's uh, yeah. I'll just add. So I think it is a living, breathing document. It's a living, breathing set of principles. They they can evolve and should evolve and adapt according to time. And maybe even new principles should should come in. And at the same time, also we have to reapply the principles in the context. And decisions might change because of the new context. But the principles don't have to change to come up with a new decision. So I think it's it's a bit of both. In my opinion. In the context of the work from home, sort of hybrid sort of scenario, uh, people principles are evolving, need to evolve. Um, how are we thinking of the different people principles coming uh, along with this new relationship with work? So as an example, the weekly town hall wasn't there pre-pandemic. But we felt that in this new, more digital world, a weekly town hall makes sense. So that was a the trust and transparency point applied in the post-pandemic world to come up with a new ritual, which is the weekly weekly town hall. Um, if it is a when we when we thought of work from home and work from office hybrid, etc., we publicly stated that we will be absolutely one of the last to push people back into office, bring people back into office. We will be the last ones to do that. We will be laggards in this, right? We will probably not, uh, certainly not want to lead this by asking people to come from office. Again, because it is a manifestation of freedom, right? We wanted more freedom. 
and we had work from anywhere right from 2016. So the idea is that you have the principles, you just have to use those principles in the new context in order to make newer decisions. I think these are just two examples, but I'm sure there are other examples that others can point out to where we are using our people principles in order to update our decisions in a new context. I just to slightly go, I think I had one question for Rahul today. We have multi-skilled people, we have data scientists, we have data engineers, consultants, design and everything. So if we go and ask a data scientist, he or she, they may say, but I would only do as well, I don't do anything. Engineers will say, I only code, I don't do anything. It's consultant, something else, design something else, right? How do you see this uh, situation happening and what is your thoughts on it uh, today in the hybrid? Oh, uh, uh, so in my opinion, I think, um, see, look, this is not a fractal problem, right? In every trade, uh, there is a hierarchy of roles. Some roles are more glamorous than others. And I, I was uh, guilty of that, right? Uh, I've come from a quant background all my life. So I thought if I know maths and statistics, I'm the smartest guy in the room who will make the biggest client impact. Very quickly, I was brought down to earth. And Fractal was uh, uh, very responsible for doing that. So I truly, truly think Fractal's philosophy principle is a, is a very equalizing philosophy. Um, we have enough empirical evidence to show that the best data scientists or the greatest AI engineers are not the necessarily the folks who will drive impact, right? So every role is as respectable as the other. I don't think we reinforce this too much. Um, again, in the uh, in in all openness, if you see what happened after the Gen AI revolution started, right? All of us do you know head straight into building AI apps because that's generally where a lot of us try to gravitate, right? Um, but uh, really, we all know client impact is created when everything comes together. And fractal is known, uh, you know, as a geometrical object that is self-similar at all levels. <laughs> so if you are, uh, if Shrikant is driving a, a certain vision of culture, I think everywhere in that organization should be a microcosm of that culture. And I think that is something we need to reinforce as we scale from thousand to four thousand, four thousand to ten thousand, and beyond. I noticed something that I should say it. So far, we we had we have four values and seven people principles. There's one of those principles that was not covered through this yeah. entire conversation, <laughs> and you brought it up. So we have the fun topic. Uh, people principle number five, the, which is, you know, content of a work is respectable, and it's it, so why and not the what. That's the only one we did, hadn't talked about, <laughs> and you brought it up. So that gives you some sense <laughs> that we are certainly, whether or not we actively think about it, those people principles are behind the scenes in how we people principles and values are behind the scenes in terms of how we think, how we act here. Yes. It's just great. It's great. With that, I think we are almost, uh, I think we can talk for many hours for our culture, but mm. we have no time. So thanks a lot. Uh, uh, what a fantastic time. I think we all enjoyed uh, what we did today. I think this is very important uh, to have an open dialogue and, uh, you know, talk to each other to make sure that our culture fabric, uh, you know, stays strong. So this is, one of those experiences which we wanted to do, and we did this, but this is not the last. We will do more of this across Fractal and uh, make sure that we keep our culture alive and make sure we are all, and many of us will be here <laughs> uh, to celebrate our you know, Silver Jubilee, Golden Jubilee, Diamond Jubilee, and Centenary anniversaries. I do not know till then. <laughs> but still, Fractal will be uh, definitely there. So thanks a lot for... Uh, coming together and sharing your you know raw emotive self uh, uh, to keep the uh, you know fractal culture uh, going alive. So thanks guys, and until we meet, I think uh, next time, be curious, be real, and be unfiltered. Thank you. Mm -hmm.